Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. It's me, Chelsea Fagan, your intrepid host, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet. I thought a lot about how I would want to have this conversation with our guest today because she is someone that those of you who have followed the channel for a while know we have worked with on several occasions. Our guest, YouTuber, film critic, author, video essayist, Lindsay Ellis, is someone who made, among other things, a four-video series back in January of 2020 for TFD called Pop Culture Portfolio, where she explores the intersection of money and pop culture, how money is represented in media, et cetera. It's a series that we're at TFD all very proud of and that has gotten a great reception from you guys. But she is also someone who this year has been on the receiving end of what we will call in imperfect parlance a cancellation, um, sparked from a few tweets, which I think you'll see as the conversation unfolds, um, were probably not taken in the best of faith. She was at one point the number one worldwide trending topic as people from both her personal, professional, and totally anonymous internet lives um, sort of all came down on her at once uh, in, again, what we can only really describe in our imperfect parlance as a cancellation. People were digging up all kinds of old tweets of hers, um, coming out with, you know, sort of I knew it type language about her um, and generally giving her a very, um, let's just say, uncharitable interpretation of her intentions, both with the initial tweet and with the subsequent sort of digging on her. When this was happening, obviously, as someone who's known Lindsay for a while, who's worked with her, who admires her work, who's a consumer of her work myself, I was extremely uncomfortable. I felt obviously on a human level very badly for her, but I also more generally felt very bad for good creators on this platform. As you guys probably know, if you're consumers of YouTube, there's a lot of really bad and noxious shit on this website. There's a lot of stuff on here that genuinely radicalizes people towards all kinds of nefarious ends. There's tons of misinformation. There's tons of polarized demonization of oppositions along political and social lines. There's content that also is just a huge waste of time that's not very thoughtful, that's not very well made, that doesn't inspire the best of us. And so a creator like Lindsay, who has spent years making really thoughtful, intelligent criticism about film and television, who's entertained us, who's educated us, whose work has been featured in literal college curriculums, especially for female creators, there's just not a ton of them out there. And creating an online environment where there are more people creating content like Lindsay's is one of my primary goals with the limited platform that I have on the internet. My domain happens to be money. I want people to talk about it and think about it more thoughtfully. And I want more voices who have a thoughtful, nuanced, and humane take on personal finance to emerge. So when I saw what was happening to Lindsay, the thing that worried me on a more existential level was, what is this experience going to teach to other young creators, especially women creators, about the risks and rewards of putting yourself out there in the way that Lindsay had? This situation has obviously been taking a huge mental and emotional toll on Lindsay, and quite frankly, I'm very honored that she was willing to sit down and talk with us about it and to be so candid about the financial realities of that experience. Overall, our conversation, to be totally honest, left me a little disheartened only because seeing the visible toll that that kind of experience can take on a creator with a body of work as long and positively impactful as Lindsay's can doesn't inspire a huge amount of confidence for the future of our discourse or these platforms. But if nothing else, I hope that in watching this conversation and hearing from Lindsay, we can all be a little bit more thoughtful and maybe honestly a little bit more hesitant and conscientious about how we interact online with people and ideas that we might not like. We don't necessarily have to only ever be positive. I think toxic positivity is bad too. But I think that there are ways to interact with these ideas and people that not only treat them as human beings, but also take a much wider lens to the totality of their work, what they're putting out in the world, how they're changing their little corner of the internet for the better or the worse. I hope you guys will enjoy this conversation with Lindsay and find it as eye-opening as I did. And in the meantime, of course, don't forget to check out all of the wonderful work that she's created both here on TFD and on her own channels down in the description. Without further ado, my chat with Lindsay. 
Hello. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. How's, uh, yeah, welcome to fabulous sunny LA. The weather's better here. It just is. It, it's, but you know what? It's not been bad in New York, I have to say. Oh, yeah? Um, so you've had quite a year. What's been going on? Um, let's see. Well, um, I have a book coming out in October. <laughs> this is your second uh, book, right? This is my second book, which is a sequel to the first book. It says Axiom's End, which came out last year. Um, the paperback of that comes out in July. Um, and yeah, I guess I'm best known right now for having been the top trend worldwide twice in the space of a month for... Uh, um, I don't know. How would you describe it? Accusations of racism. <laughs> you know, it's, really, it's always awkward. We're just like, where there's smoke, there's fire, huh? <laughs> right. So you were, as you're sort of tepidly describing it, canceled in the parlance this year. Can you tell us what happened? Well, the, I did make a video on it. If, if for those of you who haven't seen it, it's called Max Scoff. It's like the second most recent video on my channel. Um, but basically, I, you know, you know, since prim, prim, primarily known as a film critic, a lot of times I would just kind of pop off opinions of whatever I had just seen. And basically, I, I don't I wouldn't even say like two unpopular opinions in a row. One, but like neither I would particularly walk back. One was just about soul and how I thought it was weirdly pro-lifey. Um, mm. And a lot of people started to get agitated about that. Like, oh, so you just don't like movies starring people of color. And I'm like... Um, that's, that's all right. Leap. That's a, all right. Um, and then it was the, the one I really got in trouble for was about Raya and the Last Dragon, a movie that nobody saw, <laughs> including the people who started the uh, dog pile, which, you know, it, it may be they didn't intend for that to happen, but that was what happened. And I said something to the tune of it's, it was like half of all YA that had been published in the last five years. Mm. Um, and obviously that was hyperbole, but it was also kind of true. Like most of the YA fantasy I've read in the last five years is very obviously influenced by Avatar, The Last Airbender. Mm -hmm. um, and so the narrative became like, oh, since they're both Asian inspired, you're implying that all Asian inspired things are the same genre. I did exactly what you're not supposed to do because this basically happened while I was asleep and I woke up and saw people were like, I can't believe you said this. And I'm like, I just... <laughs> Even now, I have a really hard time getting into the headspace where that interpretation made sense. Mm -hmm. So I did exactly what you're not supposed to do and got defensive and tried to explain myself, which you should never, ever, ever do. Um, and, well, it kind of snowballed from there. And then I was just honestly really furious because it wasn't because a lot of people would say that it's like, oh, it's just Twitter puritans who like need to feel powerful. And that was absolutely not true. Like there were like some blue check marks that got in on it. People I've actually worked with, Oof. like uh, <laughs> that, like just basically kind of was just like, ooh, you know, this sounds, this seems fun. Even though like almost nobody who had joined in on this conversation was familiar with the media in question. Um, and uh, like, if I still feel, if I still sound defensive about it, it's because I am, because I've seen so many people be like, well, why didn't you address the valid criticism? And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you, man. I disagree <laughs> that it's valid. Right. I just don't think it's valid, so I'm not going to address it. And me being nice is not naming names, <laughs> which, you know, was sort of like, e even then, uh, you know, was called a bully for, you know, even alluding to people or using tweets that you know people made about me while still blocking out their names um but yeah so basically i deleted my twitter account and that was what made me trend it wasn't the original tweet it was me deleting my twitter account right because it was like they pushed her off yeah and so the narrative became i was chased off of twitter and i'm just sort of like well obviously it was my choice mm. to delete my twitter account but i can't say there's no truth to that you know, sure. where I'm just like, I felt like there were so many people that were just waiting for the excuse to like, you know, topple me. And like, again, there is some truth to that. Like, absolutely. People like gleefully joined in or else there wouldn't have been this like dossier of <laughs> bad problematic takes I've made over the last 13 years. Um, just ready and waiting to go, um, which was also another thing that happened because most people that saw the tweet were just like, I don't understand like why is this such sure. a big deal and so then people in order to kind of justify this reaction be like ah no but here's the dossier of every <laughs> iffy thing she has said in the last 13 years and um so yeah i don't know i just sort of like at, on the one hand yeah it is absolutely true that it was my decision but on the other hand it's like you can only take so much before you're just like 
I can't do this anymore. I can't be people's scapegoat for like the things they like the unjustness of the world, you know. So, you know, what's interesting about this is that I talked to a couple people before I interviewed you, including people who work in our own company. But like, I would say that basically none of our employees are very online. Like they work online, but they're very like, yeah, it's very hard to explain. Right. (laughs) And (laughs) every single person that I talked to about this, like I even told my Spanish tutor about it and she was like, okay, like like, (laughs) this does not make sense. And I think what's so incredible about it to me is not so much what you were taken to task over, because I do think we've seen very, very spurious inciting incidents. But I do think it's a total flattening of uh, what is this person's intent? What is the totality of their work point toward? Obviously, I think most people who are familiar with you are familiar with you because of your film criticism, which is usually, if anything, fairly politically neutral. But anyone who's a little bit more familiar with you. Oh, man, you, by YouTube standards, I am hard left. I'm it's like true. A, by, by like a Maoist. But I think a more casual viewer would be yeah, like, oh, I yeah. saw her video about like Jurassic Park. Or yeah, whatever. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do think anyone with like, enough familiarity about you to have been part of that discourse is clearly aware of the fact that when it comes to economic and social policies and things of that nature, you're clearly a long, well-established oh, no. advocate for progressive causes. I saw so many people that were like had the most bizarre takes that were just like, she said this one thing or used this one tone like five years ago and I knew it. Basically, it was all like, you know, just sort of like, I always knew this was going to happen. I remember someone called me like, wrote film school anodyne live journal film criticism. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. Yeah. Um, one that uh, just basically was mad about like the follower count and how I should know better. Um, I mean, to me, it was just like illustrative about how performative a lot of these like cancelings are because I'm like, do you actually believe this or are you just doing this for dunk points because you think that this is it's a safe bet that I'm just going to remain unpopular on Twitter forever? Um, You know, because there's just something incredibly like you don't actually care, but you do want some clout for being on the right side of whatever the issue is of the day. Did you interact with any of those people like face to face or Absolutely dm not. to dm no no fuck them right yeah because i feel like <laughs> that like especially if it's someone that you worked with or you knew in a real capacity like i feel like that would be pretty hard to maintain in a one-on-one conversation no no i'm i'm just i, I i'm just like honestly because i see i see some people that like try to you know silver lining it but i've like not even me i've seen this happen so many times a lot of times to like very close friends and i'm just like this whole process has just made me so cynical. Like, I just, like, whenever I see someone on Twitter say anything, I just assume, like, okay, this is some sort of performance. You're just doing this for clout. You don't actually believe anything. Mm. Um, Like, it has just completely, I have, like, no faith in, like, this idea of, like, accountability anymore. Well, but that's, (laughs) I mean, I think part of the issue is that when it's at scale, all intention is flattened and all punishment is sort of, equalized like there's no even if you in your mind perceive yourself as engaging in a measured way if there are a million people engaging at once right that can't be perceived as measured i think one thing that that always worries me about this is i do feel that often the targets of these kinds of phenomena are the people who are likely to in some way be most receptive to it you mentioned the fact that you engaged which is the thing you should never do and i think that's probably true But I also think that the reason why it can be so much more effective to dogpile people who ostensibly probably share a lot of your values and a lot of your political beliefs um, is because they are going to, to some extent, feel beholden to it. They're going to be affected by it. Whereas like fucking Tom Cotton, like that monster's out there, like making people's lives miserably worse every day. And Donald Rumsfeld died, an old man safe in his bed. Right. And they (laughs) couldn't care less. Like they they thrive off of it. And they're, I think, even Ben Shapiro, I think, has like a humiliation fetish. I think. I think he actually gets off on well, let's every just say time that man trends. has a lot of weird fetishes. Yeah, I think he loves it. Like he sees himself trend, people dunking on him. He's like, oh yes, yes. give it to me, baby. He loves it. But yeah. <laughs> how do you reconcile having a cynicism about it, which I think I would probably share if I were mm-hmm. in your position, with not wanting to become a poster child for the people who on their end cynically want to dismiss all criticism as being just a part of a mob? I don't know. I don't honestly think that should be my responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> I guess like, if, you know, it's just sort of like if you're trying to balance optics and how your narrative will be weaponized against the left, which 
absolutely happened. You know, it and, did? and yeah, uh, Sar, old friend of the family, Sargon. Hi, baby. That man is still alive. Because <laughs> like, I mean, we always know every time he does a podcast episode like about me, his little goblins flood my comments section, oh, and my moderator has to like, ding, 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 ding. Um, and like sometimes they go into my Goodreads, it's like a mess. But like they, hmm. you know, basically there was this sort of narrative on right wing Twitter that was like she deserves this because this is the crowd that she catered to and this is what they always do and they always eat their own. And I'm sort of like, I personally, you know, you're free to disagree, but I don't feel like I should have to like anticipate that or to try right. to tailor my statement around how Sargon is going to frame it. Right. No, sir. Um, and so, and I think I was like, cause I addressed this in my video too, is like, there's a big problem where people in left-leaning and progressive spaces do not admit that, yes, these systems absolutely are abused all the time. I don't think it's, for what it's worth, your responsibility to control or even really, like, invest in how your narrative is going to be used. Yeah. However, when you see it being used in a certain way, what do, what do you feel about that? Nothing. I turn off. You just I can't. It. No. I mean, just, like, I think another thing people don't realize about, like, influencers or public figures of any stripe is, like, you have... I believe spoons is the metaphor right now. Spoons. And I have none left, you know. Yeah. I just, you know, I I basically have, like, had to just completely detach from most things. And, you know, because I'm, I just don't engage. I just kind of, like, well, that happened. Moving on. Has it <laughs> changed the kind of content you want to produce? See, has it affected the content I produce? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's just, like, whenever something like this happens, it just completely destroys the trust you have with your audience. Sure. Um, and how can you make content for people that you're, like, kind of afraid of, right? Like, right. you have to tailor things in, like, um, a certain way and make sure that, like, you know, you're – whatever you say isn't going to be taken out of context or, you know, interpreted in the least, you know, charitable possible way – it just it just makes it impossible to do anything, you know, and there's no, you know, you because you're not thinking in terms of making a point, you're thinking in terms of covering your own ass. And that's not a way to, you know, be creative. It just makes it impossible. Well, it it really makes me, it made me feel at the time so upset because, you know, the exposure that we've had, that the extent to which we've worked together has been fairly limited. But I think about, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of people who have watched the videos that you created with us about, you know, how we view money in pop culture. And I think about all those people who now consume the media that they consume in a way that's more thoughtful from a financial perspective, who have a, a, a keener understanding of these things. And to think that all of that, and that's just the limited stuff that you've done with our channel, mm -hmm. that all of that sort of means nothing right. when we get to this kind of a, a, a backlash that there's no accounting for all of this work and that often we can drive people away. Do you feel resentful about it? Yeah, you absolutely. Do. I think there's a glee in this idea of unmasking people, which is why I titled the, titled the video the way I did, where it's just like this, this idea that whatever... Um, you know, because again, this is one of Sargon's favorite uh, narratives is that whatever you put out into the world, you don't actually believe it. You're saying the most politically expedient thing that'll make you popular, mm -hmm. you know, and if your if your media criticism is in such and such a way, you're, you know, you're not actually saying something you believe. You're just spouting whatever, you know, the woke talking points of the day are. And um, so... <sighs> That is sort of the, I think that's sort of the mindset that people come into whenever they're like, and that is why nothing you have ever said was ever honest. And mm. this is your real self, is mm. the, the self we've made up where, you know, comparing the Disney thing to the Nickelodeon thing is indicative of me saying all Asians are the same. And that's the real you. And so none of this other stuff is real or honest. You just said that and did that for money, is the narrative. <laughs> like. I feel like in the most sort of, what's the word I'm looking for, like uncharitable and disingenuous cancellation stories, there are obviously a fair amount of right-wing grifters whose entire origin story was like, I was a liberal, yeah. and then I was canceled, and now I believe in like trickle-down economics, yeah. <laughs> which I think is like, there's no way that's sincere, right? Mm-hmm. Have your ideologies, political no. alignments, values changed? None no, not at all. But I think there are some very like, I don't want to say weak-minded, but easily 
um, gaslit people who absolutely that's happened to. Mm. Like I've met some of these people where basically like the, you know, they'll get chased out of a lefty space for saying something tone deaf and then someone on the right is nice to them and they will completely disagree with them politically, but that doesn't matter. And what matters is they were nice to them. And then they agree that, yes, you were treated unfairly by these woke liberals, blah, blah, blah. And over a period of time, they do change their um, political alignments because, you know, the the right wingers were who was nice to them. Um, so I, I think it really kind of depends on like, you know, are you susceptible to that sort of thing? Because I do think it happens. Sadly, I think it happens too. <laughs> Interestingly, you probably don't know this, but when I was about three months into my writing career, I wrote an article that went mega viral for very bad reasons. And I was proto canceled at mm-hmm. the time. Like we didn't call it that, but I basically wrote about how the slut walk was an embarrassment because women who dress slutty, like they don't deserve to be assaulted, but what do you expect? Like it was horrible. And like at the time, I, w- I think I was 22. I had like a lot of like really confused like quasi libertarian yeah, beliefs and that was also does. like at a time when like feminism was not popular it was like right no. before gamer game it was like all kinds of, it was yeah there were, we i was coming out of a very specific context let's say. <laughs> but being sort of quote unquote canceled at that time and having that be such even to this day a high part of my google results in some ways at the time like it I do look back and think like, well, maybe to an extent that inoculates me because if anyone goes digging, like it's on page one, girl. Nope. But then I thought, <laughs> well, probably doesn't because there are other things. But I do remember my first, like for the first month, especially my thought was that I was like, I want to go even further into these mm-hmm. really yeah. reactionary beliefs because at least I won't be treated a certain way if yeah. I align myself with those people. Yeah, exactly. And I think most people, like it's really hard to like, prioritize abstract, you know, like theoretical beliefs about how we can like, you know, build a more robust welfare system and, you know, get money out of politics versus the way people treat you on the day to day. You know, I think most people just want people to be nice to them. And I think, you know, I'm not going to say that my political beliefs have changed, but like I definitely, even well before this would tailor, you know, what I said on social media. Um, and like omit things that I thought might be controversial or might, you know, lead to a, a, you know, a bad interpretation or something. Um, so like, yeah, I I would absolutely like self-censor just in, you know, just because I'm like, uh, you know, my opinion doesn't really matter on this thing and I'm not going to affect anything and it's just going to bring misery to me personally. Therefore, I'm just not going to say anything. I have to be honest that your situation was the first one that after years happened, I did go through and I Googled myself in a lot of keywords because yours was the first one that really gave me that feeling because I always sort of naively felt, I think before that, my content speaks for itself. Like Mm -hmm. people know who I am. They know my values. They know the work that I do. They know the life that I live and that will be good enough. And I think that the extent to which your experience was so obviously in bad faith Mm -hmm. and so easily sort of self-propagating it was you know I had candid conversations with some of my coworkers. like if this happens like from a financial perspective and I do want to get to the finances like there has to be a contingency plan Mm -hmm. because I do think no matter how far out of my way I go to make sure that I'm representing myself and my company in a way that I think would withstand something like that if there's a motivated enough contingent and enough quote-unquote evidence no matter how spurious it can happen to you, I think. No, absolutely. And I think people, that that's a big problem that people always have with stuff like this is like they're like, um, again, with a lot of the good faith valid criticism I was getting even after the video went up where, you know, they would try to explain like, well, here's why, what, why that tweet was problematic actually, even if like you take into consideration the context of the media in question. And um, like, you, you know, it's just like, basically all this sort of like reverse engineering to kind of be like, well, you kind of deserved it, you know, because you did do something wrong. Um, And uh, like the the reverse engineering, I think, is like just this this impulse people have to sort of like 
reassure themselves that they have control of their own like narrative of their own like you know the way they're perceived by other people the way people will treat them and it's just it's just a lie it's a delusion you don't have control over this sort of thing like if it if it hadn't been that it could, it could have been something you know it could have been something else it could have been another thing that was dug up you know my bad prince of egypt opinions <laughs> like, listen what are they because i'll call them out right here and now let's get <laughs> <sighs> yeah it's a uh, uh, so it, it basically, it you know, it really, it, it 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 isn't. What's the opposite of merit? Like the it it really warranted, can have, unwarranted. Yeah, yeah, it really can just be anyone for any reason. Well, and I think our cultural discourses around things like problematic have made it so that a it's like no longer sort of an instinct if, if you have an instinct to say like this person sucks I don't like what they do mm-hmm. it's that's not acceptable because that's bullying that's mean so to wrap it in the language of they're problematic yeah. or to to put some sort of emotional right, psychological yeah. spin and I think gives valid validity and also puts you in the position of like now you're doing something morally righteous yeah exactly and, you know like I think people have just lost the ability to dislike people or media without it framing it in a way that is like, and I'm also I'm doing the world justice. I'm doing a good thing here. They need like, oh, so-and-so uh, like abused their girlfriend or like, right. yeah, like threw a rock through a window and that's why you can't like their music. You know, it's just like, we, we have just like lost the ability to just be like, not for me. Meanwhile, and I feel like this is what's most frustrating about it. There are so many people who like, have actual like serious, serious criminal pasts or have mm-hmm. done things that are really duplicitous who like continue to skate by on all kinds of images. It just is also so sort of inconsistently applied mm-hmm. in terms yeah. of the person who receives it. And I think it's probably not a coincidence that yours exploded at a time right. where your success was very visible. Yeah. And I, I think, and I had a lot of people that did remember something I said, uh, something to the tune of like, no apology was ever demanded in good faith. But right. I still think that's true. You cannot demand an apology from someone. Right. You can hope for one. You can ask for one. But if you're demanding something, you're not asking for a sincere, you know, uh, reconciliation. You're asking for performance. You know, you're asking for them to bend the knee. Right. You, you are, rather, you're demanding it because you cannot demand an apology from someone. Right. An apology should be given yeah. organically. I will apologize for things that I think I did wrong, but this specific thing, I'm like, at most it could be explained. It deserves context, but an apology is an admission of wrongdoing and a commitment to do better. What has the impact been financially? Well, um, at first, um, you know, I my Patreon was pretty par. I definitely lost some patrons, but like when I deleted my Twitter account, I gained a few, like, I think I lost like 50, but I gained like 200. So what's the scale we're talking about? Like how many do you have overall? Um, I think I have about 9,000 right now. Okay. So it was like, you know, like a, like a percent. Um, sure. did you see blowback from things like sponsors or your pre-roll revenue? Um, I mean, if I did, I didn't notice it. Um, definitely not from uh, YouTube AdSense. Um, this was not the sort of thing that would make sponsors nervous. Sure. And it's not the sort of thing that, like, you know, is, is necessarily going to make me look unsympathetic. It absolutely is the sort of thing that makes the left and progressives look unreasonable. Because most people don't, like, if you read the tweet, they don't understand the problem. Like, right. my mom I think, still doesn't yeah. understand the problem. I think <laughs> any normal person does not understand the problem. But also, I mean, even if they did, even if someone were to say, like, eh, they could maybe have phrased that in a yeah. different way, they would never understand the response. But so to people, and I'm sure that this is something you've probably heard, and it's not how I feel, but I think it's worth asking, like, to someone who would say to you, well, your Patreon's increased, your sponsors didn't back out, you still get just as many, if not more, views on your videos, you're fine. And I definitely saw that a lot. Like Mm -hmm. whenever, cause like there was this interesting like sort of turn like on Twitter where sympathy wasn't with me at first whenever the video went up, but as as more people watched it, you know, it became less and less trendy, shall we say, to talk shit about me. You'd get a lot more pushback. You'd have a lot more people like talking, like say like, did you watch the video? Um, And so the, you know, whenever the argument that I am like a secret bad person no longer held water, it turned into, but she has money. That makes it okay. Do you feel like there's space for you to say, because I mean, I'm obvious, it's, it seems clear that this is something that's really emotionally difficult for you. Mm -hmm. um, That is, I mean, even months later, still to grapple with. Do you feel that 
there is space or grace even to just say in whatever form, like, this is very hard emotionally. And I even as an adult don't feel that I even have the tools to really navigate it emotionally and mentally. Do you feel that that's something you can say and, and yeah. be heard? I, I, no, well, not be heard because it's sort of like, you know, I, I joking about the, uh, you know, the um, DJ Khaled album cover suffering from success and he's wearing like these chains, you know, and bling. I it's love just, DJ like, Khaled. <laughs> like, uh, you're just like me having to pay my taxes, suffering from success. Yeah. But like, that's just not a thing people are going to be sympathetic to, even though like, no, nah. like in my experience, absolutely not. Like, you know, if they're going to be sympathetic to you, they're going to be sympathetic to you, whether you're, you know, rich or not. And like, to me, the rich thing is like also really annoying because like unlike a lot of my you know sort of like you I don't have a self I have a company right and I have like five you know no seven people on payroll plus I pay for nine people's health insurance um you know it's just like I you know it's just like even if you you do like all of my patreon goes right back into payroll the right. only money I keep for myself is uh book money really like right. that's the only savings I have is money I make off of books so like yeah, but it's just like, but people, you know, just like if they are making this argument that, you know, you're rich, therefore you're a perfectly valid punching bag, they don't care. About, like, you know, they don't, they don't right. care about the logistics of like what my monthly finances are like or, you know, where the money actually goes or how much I'm allowed to keep for myself. Um, yeah, they don't care. It's just an excuse. So you have a book coming out still. When? Well, um, I have... So the, I have two versions of my first book coming out. One, the hardcover of the first book is coming out in the UK in July. And just to make it really confusing, the paperback of the first book is coming out in America in August. And then, <laughs> and then my second book is coming out in October, um, October 16th. And uh, yeah, hopefully people will read it. Are you still planning to go on book tour and promote the book? And <sighs> No, but that doesn't have anything to do with this. That is, Macmillan is still not doing live events. Bookstores are not doing live events. Oh, we're Macmillan too. Don't know why. It's yeah. Really, it's really frustrating. But. Yeah, events have been all over the place. But are you still, do you feel a different relationship toward promoting the book in any form after all of this? Um, I, I think the thing is like, I used to have to feign humility, and now I don't care. So I yeah. guess that's kind of liberating. Yeah. When I say feign humility, I mean like I mean I guess there's still some truth to the fact that like self promo makes me so uncomfortable. Yeah. Um. But like with the first book, I would just kind of like neg the book to the point where it was honestly getting on people's nerves. So I was like, all right, we're not going to do that this time. I'm going to try to like at least you know be positive about it in my way, you know, like in a way that's not dishonest, but I'm not going to like, you know, kind of sweep any praise under the rug like I did with the first one. And um, so I, I guess it's just made me a lot less self-conscious about the way I uh, promote it because like I used to be so like, you know, carefully, you know, constructing the brand in a certain way. And right. now I'm just like, well, it's dashed on the floor anyway. I may as well do whatever. Do you feel that the audiences that you have for the books and the other stuff are somewhat separate? It's hard to say. I, I They're not as separate as I would like, honestly. Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, it's sort of like this double-edged sword of having a YouTube channel means you are exposed a lot more than you would have been otherwise, um, meaning I can promote it to people. But the sort of like flip side to that is like people will buy it because of who I am, not because they're necessarily interested in that type of book. You know, I've heard a lot of people, you know, be like, ha ha, I read it in your voice. I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's not what I wanted. Um, so, uh, you know, and a lot of people who would not have read it did and didn't like it, you know, and it's just sort of like, it's just, you know, it, it's a weird double-edged sword where I, I wish, you know, my my author self was unknown to the reader. Right. But, you know, on the other hand, that's the only reason why most people bought it in the first place. That's true. That fame, buddy. Double-edged <laughs> sword. That is why Twitter is terrible. You know, it's just like, it's the it's the website for cheap, cheap dunks and then you're rewarded for it and then you're, you know, desire for validation is pinged and you know you get your little dopamine hit and then you forget you said anything and you move about your day you know i think twitter is genuinely useless for actual meaningful conversation and i think it is irredeemably so do you still use it i use it for promotion i don't know if it's like if anybody can tell because like i i don't interact and like i don't like tweets anymore because i don't actually control my own twitter account anymore um 
That's my, probably for the best. Yeah, my, my, my agency does. Like, if, if, I, if there's a tweet, I probably wrote. If it sounds like I wrote it, I did. But, like, I don't have access to it. I don't look at my mentions. I, like, yeah. uh, I if I'm on Twitter, it's, like, I have a secret Twitter that I'm on, like, maybe for five minutes a day because it's, like, it's amazing how if you're, if you're not able to interact, the desire to be there at all just kind of goes away. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it definitely seems like it's for the best to not be face-to-face -face with your own mentions. Like, that seems... In well, I yeah, I guess I wasn't. But, like, even then, whenever I would, like, uh, you know, I had my default mentions to mutuals only, you know, but it still kind of triggered that addictive, you know, nature of Twitter, which, like, once I, you know, got off it, I you know, I was just like, this must be what, like, hard users who are, like, in rehab feel, you know, where it's just like right. your brain doesn't know what to do with itself. Right. Because you're so used to, like, you know, Twitter engagement and, like, oh, what do you know, you have to check on everything and, like, uh it, it just being absent of that for the first few weeks, you know, it was just like my brain did not know what to do with itself. So I think like when I say like Twitter is an addiction, I mean it like in a literal, literal way. And I think most people like other people who I have uh, close friends, whenever they would talk about giving it up and then talk themselves out of it, I'm like, you're talking like an addict. Do you not realize well, people this? are addicted to these <laughs> yeah, platforms yeah. in a very literal way? Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of people uh, are kind of hesitant to admit that. Because, you know, especially people with big platforms, which is like this is where I get my validation, you know? Yeah. Do you still, do you feel the, do you feel the same way about YouTube? Um, I just think to me, YouTube is like where the content lives as opposed to Twitter, which is a promotional platform, at right. least at this point. Like, because I, I think t I, Twitter used to be a, a platform for me promoting, to pr produce content, but now it's just purely promotional. Um. So yeah, I guess I I don't I, I don't really think of YouTube as a social media platform, even though I know it it totally is. Um, I I just think of it as just like this is the place where my content lives. But I also don't really interact with people there very much either. Did the video that you produced about this experience give you any sense of closure or ability um, yeah, to move on? Yeah, because I I could be honest, you know. Yeah, I wasn't. You know, because I think again, like I, I don't even know if it would have been the smart thing to just apologize and move on because I you know. I'm not great at being dishonest and like I did, you know, it's just like, how do you get up on a, you know, metaphorical stage and say what happened to me was unfair and unjust and completely unjustified? Like, how do I make this argument? Um, so like, that's kind of why I framed it the way I did was I had to kind of couch it in this like, okay, here's everything I have done wrong right. <laughs> over the last 13 years. And here is why diving into that is just like hideously invasive in a way that like normally, or rather it used to be the um, domain of like, you know, your Chans and your Kiwi farms, but now it's Twitter leftist babies that do it. Yeah. And um, well, I'm sure 4chan is probably still doing it. Oh, they're doing it. Like, yeah. They're, and they're, they're doing the ones, it on Reddit too. <laughs> yeah. They're the ones who collate the evidence and then they yeah. seed it to Twitter and then like they just like go off. It does make me worry that we're going to have a real inability to hold on to good people in mm -hmm. content creation, in the discourse, quote unquote, because the incentives for doing it, they can be real. I mean, there can be financial incentives, there can be validation, but the risks of doing it seem so high yeah. that I don't know how, because I want to convince more people who are, who make content like you do, or like, you know, John and Hank and all the people at Complexly do, like, I want more people like that. But if this is a possible outcome, even mm -hmm. after years of a body of great work, how do you convince people to do it? I don't know. I think it also depends on like your disposition, because I was just on a BBC podcast uh, where it was like me and uh, some like uh, TikTok, uh, like, I don't know, organic farmers. And like their takeaway was much more charitable than mine because I'm just like, fuck them kids. I, you know, I, I'm just sort of like, I have no sympathy for any of them if they, you know, if they, I genuinely am like, yeah, you extended zero grace to me. I have none for you. But they were like, you know, no, but they, you know, they meant well, you know, they, they sure they called us like a cult, but you know, they, they were trying to protect the whatever. And so I, I think it depends on your disposition because I think I am a naturally just a pessimistic person. And so this happened to me is just like, shutting down done and i'm like you know have zero space em emotional space to kind of um you know contextualize or forgive honestly but you know so other people might be willing to put up with it i guess maybe not put up but just kind of accept it and like 
frame it in a way that like, okay, yeah, maybe Twitter is rewarding people's absolute worst impulses, but they mean well. And right. you know, just sort of like, it really just kind of depends on your disposition. Because I know a lot of people, women especially, are just, you know, naturally sensitive people. They want to be liked. They don't want to, they don't like the idea that they might be taken out of context or they might hurt someone by being honest, you know? Um, and so how do we accept this risk? How do I like, meter myself and phrase my words in a way that there is no risk for that and it's just like it's impossible but like you know well and I also think that it's a question of human psychology because if you were to look at the aggregate of what your work has produced both in terms of benefit and in terms of the response I'm sure it's a hundred to one of people who've liked your videos mm-hmm. who have commented positively who've gotten something out of them who've used them in classrooms so I think if you were to look at the numbers it's probably maybe not a hundred to one but probably close to it in oh, terms absolutely. of the positive but it is I think very difficult psychologically to in any way make that calculus right and also you know again it's like your personality it's just like do I like I like positive reinforcement just washes over me I internalize none of it Mm. like you know uh, and again just like most of the feedback I get at least to my face like I don't know about like the greater discourse but like comments you know mentions you know Instagram whatever like they're positive but like I don't internalize those I Mm. dwell on the negative yeah and I think a lot of people know this they assume this because they do the same thing and so they like kind of go out of their way to like do these pissy little things that they know I'm going to see and um so just like that knowledge it's just like it just gets in your craw and it just lives in you in a way that like you know because you're you you start to see like the positivity as like well that's the default that's how it should be and these things are aberrations and that's why we need to uh, you know fixate on them and address them and all that nonsense this is a personal question that you're definitely not obligated to answer but have you seen a therapist about this no honestly like i had a therapist uh i i think this is like its own issue that like at a point in history i might have given a shit about but like i had like two therapists going into the pandemic and then i just couldn't do zoom calls anymore i just hated it but like the problem with both of them is like they just can't even begin to understand what like this does to a person and even living in la i have not found a therapist that like that's shocking like how do you find someone who like understands like social media especially like with a large platform there is no research on this Mm -hmm. like there's and there's certainly nothing that like therapists can take and like apply they just like every single therapist i've talked to is just like why don't you just log off you Mm. know you know it's It's shocking that there's not like the influencer therapist in los angeles who has like the context i mean maybe there is and they're just you know i haven't i haven't found it found them yet So to kind of wrap up and look forward, so you mentioned that you have a different relationship with content creation going forward. You mentioned that, you know, it's definitely made you kind of cynical about the work that you're producing. You mentioned that you also have a fair amount of employees that depend on you financially. How how much does the financial viability of your team and your company and the work that you do weigh on you in how you're thinking about all this and how you move forward oh a lot if you want me to be honest i would have quit like i would have been like fuck y'all bye after that scoff went up if if i didn't have employees have you had conversations with them about this yeah um i mean we have we have a loose plan they know what it is so uh but yeah i i I can't say that like you know being a business owner and having people depend on me didn't absolutely you know influence my decision to keep going about it even if if even in the milk toast way that i do um yeah you know as a kind of final thought for me in any case what's so striking to me about this is that I think, and I'm sure you'd probably agree that if you wanted to keep going and keep just making great film videos and keep making a nice profit for your company or what have you, like, I think you very much could. Like, Mm -hmm. I think that this would not prevent you from doing that. Yeah, yeah. It hasn't affected my numbers at all. So I think it just speaks really strongly to the human and psychological tool that that would not be appealing. Yeah, exactly. And like, even I mean supporters get it because I've seen a lot of people like concerned about me personally and I'm just sort of like there's that part of me that's like oh don't worry and then I'm like no actually absolutely you should worry (laughs) like you know it's just sort of like even 
I mean, God, I can't even imagine if I, because I had a very robust support system yeah. during the whole thing. Um, and a lot, like a lot of people like looked over that video. Um, like, you know, and a lot of them are just like the usual suspects, like exactly who you would think. Um, you mean your friends? Yeah, my okay. friends who are also YouTubers, some of whom have like basically created the rubric for how to respond to like being overblown canceled. or completely unjust cancellations. Um, and uh, so I can't imagine what it would have been like for me if I didn't have that, you know? Well, I hope that at least people who see this conversation in videos like the one you made can at least maybe on a small scale start to think more conscientiously about how they interact mm -hmm. with people and content on the internet. I yeah, hope. I mean, I guess I have seen that at least, like when the video went up and the people who did watch it all the way through, like I did see a lot of comments that were like, you know, I had been th being really uncritically participating in dog piles. So yeah. that's going to make me reevaluate that. So yeah. I mean, listen, <laughs> Well, silver yeah. lining. Um, well, thank you for coming on and for speaking so um, honestly about your experience. I know that, you know, social media is all crazy right now, but what about people who want to buy your book? Um, yeah. Well, you can do that at uh, any fine retailers. I think uh, depending on when this comes out, some uh, independent bookstores will have signed copies. Otherwise, you can order signed copies um, online through our portal um, on Macmillan's website. All right. It's called Truth of the Divine. It's out October 16th. So as always, guys, thank you for watching. And don't forget to subscribe and to come back every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday for new and awesome videos. Goodbye.